Kia ora koutou, ko te kuhatu whaka iri ana te wairangi, ko whanataua tia nga maunga, ko waihau, ko waiora nga awa, ko te kapa moana, ko kariri kura nga moana, ko tainui, ko tinana nga waka, ko nga timaru, ko te rarua nga iwi, ko mātai whitu, ko roma nga marae, ko Shari Gallup, ahau, kia ora. So I just introduced you, um, that's my pepeha, so it's a kind of uh, traditional Māori way of introducing myself to you. So my name is Shari Gallup, and I just outlined to you some of the natural landmarks from my iwi, so my tribes here in New Zealand that are you know, part of us as a people. So I told you of my mountains, my rivers, and what is my moana or my oceans. So that just provides a sense of connection to you, creates a sense of me at familiarity and it also positions myself um, and where I where I come from. So today I'm going to be talking to you about estuary. So I'm really focusing on the science of returning fresh water into estuaries. So I'm going to show you this picture now on this question, is this valuable? So hopefully most people watching here or everybody would say yes. But in the past, many places like these estuaries and their wetlands have not been seen as valuable. So in many places, they haven't been treated as they should be. Um, many cases have been extensively drained to convert to farmland or housing developments and other reasons. And they just really haven't been taken care of as much as they should be. So this is a very Aotearoa New Zealand context, these pictures I'm showing you now, but similar case occurs all over the world. So these are some of the reasons why estuaries are so important. This first image here, you can see this po, this carving. So estuaries are hugely culturally significant to many indigenous peoples, including Māori and New Zealand. They're hugely biodiverse. They're really biodiversity hotspots. They have a really unique ecosystem. In the middle there, you can see some roots. So that's a mangrove forest. So estuaries also contain a lot of vegetation and wetlands, so salt marsh and mangroves. And these are really important for sequestering carbon, so taking carbon into their biomass and also down into the sediment, also known as blue carbon. Down here, you can see um, these are some shellfish. So they're important for resources, including um, food. And in this little cartoon here, this shows some people doing some fun stuff. So estuaries are an important place for recreation, for tourism. And you can see um, a nanny here and her grandkids. So they're also a place where people come together and also hand down traditional knowledge. And the last thing I have on this slide is, is a filtering water jug. So estuaries and their wetlands are also referred to as nature's water filters or nature's kidneys so they can actually remove excess sediment and nutrients from the water as well. So the main one that I'm talking to you about today is a, a local example to where I am in New Zealand. It's known as Te Awa o Ngā Tiroirangi. So that means the water of Ngā Tiroirangi. So Ngā Tiroirangi was a great tuhunga um, or a priest and a great navigator um, of the Te Arawa Waka when it came from Hawaii. This is also known as the Makatu Estuary. So this site is hugely uh, historically important. It was a landing site of the Te Arawa Waka, and it's also been known as Te Pataka or Te Arawa, the food bowl of Te, te Arawa, because of just the absolute wealth of food like shellfish it provided. So into this estuary, so it's always mindful to remember that an estuary is connected, right? It's not just the estuary is there on its own, it's connected to the ocean and it's connected to rivers and streams. And in this case, the Makatu estuary is connected to the Kaituna River. And this quote here just describes the Kaituna River as an umbilical cord that joins the tribes of the river together from its commencement at Lake Rotoiti to Okeria Falls. The Kaituna River tribes, tribes are joined together by whakapapa or genealogy. So while this estuary is kind of at the end of that system, it also is affected by not only the physical processes further up the river, but it's um, very strongly connected culturally as well. So here's this estuary that I'm talking about. You can see this is the main ocean inlet down here. Um, the main freshwater source is up here at this end. You can see it's quite a shallow estuary. You can see some of the tidal channels in here, but you can see it's quite infilled with sediment, so mud and sand. Now this river has had a long estuary, a long history of engineering interventions. 
So back in the 1950s, um, the Kaituna River, so this is the Kaituna River here, it used to come all the way down here and just go straight into the estuary. So that was really, you know, bringing that fresh water into the estuary and flushing and all of those things. But in about 1956, the river was diverted. So you can see this is after that. This is 1959. It was moved out of the estuary. And that was largely to prevent flooding of farmland. And not surprisingly, the estuary suffered. So basically the freshwater source was taken away. It degraded. And there were all sorts of impacts since then. So this includes things like more sedimentation, increased salinity, less tidal flushing because you've got less water movement by taking away the river, more sediment build up. In some places, there were also shoreline erosion. And there was huge wetland loss as well. So nearly all the wetlands were lost in the upper estuary, including loss of harakeke. So harakeke is flax, which is a really important plant uh, for weaving. There was a big shift in the biota and a big decline in the kaimawana or the seafood. And also an increase of problems with nuisance sea lettuce and algae. So it wasn't a happy place and also lots of cultural impacts too. So it also affected, you know, the loss of affected traditional knowledge being passed down from generation to generation also. So I think one of the interesting things about this project is one of the main drivers is to restore the Modi of the river and the estuary. So Modi you can think of as a life force. So everything has a Modi and the Modi can be increasing or decreasing. And it can be sort of in a good or a bad state. So it was recognized that the Modi had decreased and one of the main drivers was to restore the Modi or the life force of the estuary and enable the tangata whenua so these are the traditional uh, Māori people of the land in that area to continue to gather kaimawana and seafood from the estuary. So I think this is an interesting way to look at restoration when you look at this idea of Māori, um, when in many other places it's driven by other things, including economy. So here's just a couple of pictures just to get our bearings. So this is looking down the Kaituna River into the estuary. Um, so this is obviously a, a man-made channel being dug out and you can see flowing down here, these little thing you here see in the middle, these are the control gates. So this is where about 20% of the river flow is being diverted back into the estuary. So it's a partial river re-diversion. And here's a picture of the gates being constructed. So we're looking upstream to the Kaituna River. You can see there's these 12 culverts or control gates. Um, this road you can see in front was temporary, so was later removed. So this is the only graph I'm going to show you today, um, but some of the things that I'm doing there is really looking at how does the water respond to this partial river re-diversion, because obviously there's a lot of science and many years of work um, behind getting these types of things to happen, costs a lot of money, and in this case there's been um, huge work on behalf of the Tangata Whenua, so the local Māori people, local community as well to get this to happen. So this is the gates here. So this is just one week in February of last year. So at this time, nine of the 12 gates were opened. So don't worry too much about the details. This is one week. Um, this green arrow shows when the gates were opened. If you focus on the black line, that's currents near the seabed in the upper estuary, so not too far from these gates. You can see each day it goes up and down with the tide. Now what's really noticeable here is that after the gates were commissioned on the 12th of February, there was about a 40% increase in the peak currents. Um, so that's in the very upper part of the estuary, but we're really trying to understand what changes have happened in the estuary as a whole and how is it going to respond in the years moving forward, because that really underpins the health, a healthy ecosystem. So I'm also looking at how do we consider climate change because estuaries are they're really at the interface of land, river and sea. So they get all of these impacts coming together. So in addition to the normal you know, anthropogenic impacts like runoff and things like that, um, climate change we know is affecting our ocean. We've got sea level rise, we've got increased temperatures, ocean acidification. And then our rivers, if we have changes in our rainfall patterns, that could change our river flows. 
And ish trees are often quite shallow as well, so probably quite prone to, to heating. So I want to better understand, you know, if we're planning a, a big scale estuarine restoration project like the one I just showed you, how do we make sure that climate change is um, fully included in that process? So um, for the last part of this talk, um, I'm just going to touch a little bit on um, doing uh, transdisciplinary science. So um, myself, I am um, have Māori Papa, Māori lineage, and also um, European as well. And it's been a bit of a journey for me learning how to how to better or how to integrate Indigenous knowledge. In our case, we call it Mataranga Māori, Māori knowledge with Western science. So this is a waka haurua. So this one is a, a really it's a beautiful waka. It's fiberglass, and they told me it was the Mercedes Benz of waka. And I got to go on this a few weeks ago, and it was part of a wānanga, so like a kind of a conference, which was really aimed at cross-cultural science in the marine space. So it was bringing together Western scientists, um, waka practitioners, um, local iwi and hapu, people from industry, the council, and it was just a, a really awesome experience. So what I'm showing you now, this little figure here, this is a waka tauroa. So it's a little bit different to the one I just showed you. In this case, we have two waka. So we have the one in the red is the kind of the Māori waka. So this one encompasses Māori worldviews, knowledge and values. And in the other one, we have um, the waka tau iwi. So this one represents the more Western way, so worldviews, knowledge and values. So both of these waka, they can travel no worries in their own right. So they're both um, legitimate. In this case, they're both traveling in the same direction, but they have come together. So temporarily, they are joined by this um, deck. So they're joined together to achieve a common purpose, and that makes them stronger together. So in this case, you can see um, this net is the whāinga or the common purpose. So they're able to come together together. And in this case, this is a really about um, management, but um, I'm really on a journey learning how to do this in my science as well. So for the estuary I was just talking about, um, part of my journey has been learning how to do that. So this is one of my um, collaborators, and also my friend, Larry Boy Corbett. So he's um, from Ngāti Whakaua Ki Makatū, um, he's Ahika, so he is um, from that place and his um, ancestors, his tūpuna, are from that place as well. So we've been working in parallel, um, learning how to do this together. And this is a photo from a couple of months ago. So this is the kūra, so the school from Makatū, and we hosted a day here in our labs, in our um, science labs, and they were looking at flax, um, harakiki. So they'd already learned some of the traditional Māori knowledge um, back home, and then they were coming to our labs to look at some of the science. So for me, it's been about learning. It's not just about the output. You know, in science, we're often very output-driven. Um, you know, we want this particular result, solve this question, get a nature paper if you're lucky. You know, there's, it's very results-driven. But on this journey, I've been very much learning. It's how you do the research is almost more important than the result. So I'd just like to leave you with this quote, uh, Manaki whenua, Manaki tangata, haere whakamua, which means care for the land, care for the people, and go forward. Kia ora. Thank you. All right. All right. Great stuff, Sherry. Thanks so much for sharing that uh, with us today. Uh, I'm just going to hit a quick pause now um, that the presentation is completed. It looks like your camera froze on us when I switched you back over uh, to the main oh. view. Oh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> um, hang on, I'll try. Yeah, yeah, no worries. I don't know what it's doing. I'm stuck with a weird look on my face. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we can do if you want, uh, if you want to exit and try and come back in and see if that kickstarts the camera again. I'll just try unplugging it and we'll see if that works. Sure. Oh. Now it's on the wrong one. There we go. There we go. We got you back. All right. Good stuff. Well, that was smooth, right? We had a little bump at the beginning, but I think that was great. I think uh, that went through really well. How'd that feel for you? Cool. Um, yeah, I think it was fine. There's always things you can do better, but um, can't get caught up in that. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, okay. Um, so what what I'm going to do now is just you know ask you a few questions, um, and then I'll I'll edit those in 
uh, kind of at, at the at the end when your presentation stops. So we have a, a few questions worked in there as well. Okay, cool. All right, awesome. Well, the first question I want to ask you, Sherry, is um, about learning the, the language. How long have you been studying the language and how have you found it's helped you with the work you're trying to do? Yeah, um, so I'll, I've come back two years ago from about 10 years overseas. Um, so I've been kind of in this process of reconnecting. Um, I'm definitely not fluent. I've been taking Te Reo Māori classes um, and evening classes. Um, and it's quite good here in Aotearoa. You see quite a lot of Te Reo Māori around and it's becoming more and more, uh, I guess, normal to see it. But I guess I got to a point in my research where I felt like it was becoming a barrier for me not being able to speak fluent Te Reo. So that's why I'm doing classes now. All right, good stuff. Well, I thought it sounded great today. Um, so you're, you're clearly picking it up uh, quite well. So thanks so much for sharing some of that with us today. Um, next question I wanna ask you, and it may be too early, you may not have results yet, but I'm wondering if you've noticed a shift in, in, in the biodiversity. Have you, have you seen a change in some of the life found uh, in the estuary since uh, the partial redirection? Yeah, so um, to this point, most of my research has been really looking at the kind of physical side of things, so the sort of water and the sediments, which is really sets the scene for the ecology. Um, but I do have a student who's about to start her project on that, so that will be really cool. Um, but yes, the, the general feedback from um, the regional council who has really been leading this project is that they do think there's some early signs of recovery. Um, I have noticed in the kind of upper areas of the estuary just from visually looking, the water does look clearer in some places and it seemed like there was a bit less um, mud. But I think it's gonna be quite a long process, um, probably many, many years until we really know what's actually happening. Okay, all right. Well, another question uh, about the project is, you know, just kind of thinking of New Zealand in general, is this, um, you know, is, is this an early, kind of stage where this has been done or has this kind of re partial redirection been done before and is this something that might be expanded in, in other areas? Yeah, um, there are other cases around the world where this has been done. There's some in the US um, and I think in South Africa where rivers have been diverted or partially re-diverted. Um, but for Aotearoa, there's New Zealand, there's quite a few sort of wetland restoration projects and things around. But as far as I know, this is the first kind of case like this one where they've sort of partially put back a river into an estuary. So I think it's a really um, interesting case to look in a lot of detail what actually happens. You now we had our hopes of what will happen, but what does actually happen in practice and how long does it take and all of these questions. So those are some of the things I'm hoping to look at in my research so we can then apply some of that theory to places elsewhere. All right, excellent. And then so... You know, you, you talked about the river, uh, the estuary and the ocean where they meet and it, you you use that quote comparing it kind of like in a, an umbilical cord. Uh, and I'm wondering um, what's kind of been the reception from the, the Maori community um, with the project and and what it's done. It, is there a feeling that there's been some balance restored? What's the, the general feeling? Um, yeah, from the people that I have talked to, people have generally been positive. Um, I think that, what, you know, there was, it's been more than 30 years since the river was basically completely taken out of the estuary, which had a huge um, physical, ecological and cultural impact. So I think people are really happy about that. Um, but I think it, it kind of remains to be seen maybe, you know, what, what actually happens and, and, and how much does it recover? Because it's not a full river re-diversion like you saw. It's only part of it. It is quite a large river. So it would be interesting to see how much recovery is possible from putting 20% of the river back. All right, good stuff. Well, Sherry, this is such a great project and I love the fact that you highlighted that, you know, we're so we're so quick to always think about the monetary value uh, when really there's so much intrinsic value, so much cultural value, um, aesthetics and such that, um, you know, we don't always have to think about that, that monetary value when we think about some of these projects. So I really appreciate that you brought that kind of to the forefront a little bit uh, with your talk today. Thank you. All right. Well, Sherry, it's great to have you join uh, us during the Global Biodiversity Festival. Thanks so much uh, for being with us. And uh, yeah, we look forward to following uh, the rest of the research and uh, 
hopefully it gets a great baseline that can be used to expand to other projects. Awesome, I hope so too, thank you. All right, thanks Sherry.